Welcome students. We have seen how Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte is one of the most romantic story of all times. So, we move now chapter 24 to 31 we will analyze. Now, that particular night of her return from Gateshead, Rochester proposes to Jane and there is a beautiful built up to the marriage wedding ceremony with a new wardrobe and uh, Jane decides uh, that she, she needs to communicate with uncle who was alive and who was related to her father's brother, lives abroad somewhere in South America. So, she sends this letter saying that she is getting married to a certain Rochester. This let loose a lot of new action. This little act of writing a letter finds that uh, the letter reaches her uncle. Uncle is friend of Mr. Mason and she, uh, the uncle contacts the lawyers in London asking them to stop the marriage at any cost because the uncle is aware that Rochester is committing adultery and Jane is not aware of this. So unwell, he cannot come to England himself. He asks his lawyers to stop. As a result, the church event of wedding becomes a scene of drama where just at the moment when uh, Rochester and Jane are supposed to say I do to each other, the lawyers um, come forward and declare that they have to protest against this marriage because it, it's actually a bigamy two marriages to the same, same man and uh, the marriage is broken off. Now, Rochester comes to console Jane. He says that uh, it does not matter. He confesses the entire story that his marriage to Bartha Mason was arranged by the family because the two families wanted to bring wealth together. Whatever the reason is, he is married still and since he cannot legally get married to Jane, he says that Jane and he run away to south of France and live together. Jane will not live in sin. She, her morality will not permit that. And from there she also concludes that she can no longer stay in the same house as Mr. Rochester because it is a temptation, because it is an inconvenient situation. She cannot go back to Gateshead because she has left that. She does not want to return to Lowood school because those are her pasts. She needs to move forward. And she just takes a stagecoach and leaves her employer's house without realizing or knowing which way she is heading. But it is another good fortune for Jane that she does not land up as a vagrant moving from place to place, but difficult circumstances where she is almost near death. She is rescued by a man and there are two sisters to this man. The three brothers and sisters live in the same house. His name is Mr. John Rivers and the three Rivers brothers and sisters take care of Jane as their own. Subsequently, she also finds out that these three brothers and sisters are her cousins related to her from her father's side. So, the story once again changes its course. Now, she has moved to another state in life and Jane has moved from a more difficult phase in life to a more comfortable one where she has rediscovered her family. She had thought that with Rochester she would find happiness. She did not find it. But she finds reward comes to her, albeit a little late, but reward comes in her in form of consolation of family. Okay, so she has moved to another state in life and here she does stay with Rivers for some time. Then she sets up a school of her own in the nearby village where she is helped by Rosamond Oliver, a very rich lady who would like to get married to John Rivers, the cousin brother. She is in love with John Rivers, but John Rivers is also a clergyman, that means a priest in the Anglican church. The interesting thing about Anglican church is that they allow their priests to marry unlike Catholic church. So, John Rivers can have a normal family life, he can get married and raise children. But he will not marry Rosamond because he thinks she being rich is not suitable for the life of a missionary. We will in the end analyze chapter 32 to chapter 38 and uh, at this point as I said John Rivers proposes to Jane. In John Rivers, once again commentary of the 
Christianity comes. Remember Helen Burns? There was Brocklehurst, his Christianity. Helen Burns said that I want to sacrifice and Christianity is all about sacrifice and wait for the gain in paradise. Brocklehurst's Christianity was very different. His Christianity was use the religion to get as much money to line his own pocket. We've seen how the author has criticized both these kinds. Now we come to the third kind, which is also under criticism. That is Mr. John Rivers kind of Christianity. What is his Christianity? He believes that he will get married to, Jane would make a wonderful wife for him because Jane has a lot of dedication. Jane can work with him and they will have a wonderful team. He's talking about a team. There is no love in it. And Jane is too passionate a character to accept something like this. She is not willing to accept anything short of falling in love with that person and wanting to share life with him. And she cannot believe that she will get enter into a loveless marriage. So she refuses her cousin. The cousin would not give up. This kind of an insistence in Rochester and John Rivers is to suggest that Jane Eyre is being constantly you know, there is a pressure to dominate or subjugate her as a woman by the male members of the society. However, to go back to the story, what happens is, it is in River's house that she learns that the uncle who has died has left an enormous fortune for, uh, for Jane. And uh, she is not selfish. She keeps a little bit of the fortune for herself and she shares it with other three cousins, the, Rivers, the two River's sisters and John River's. So they, and they live together, but uh, she again has a supernatural experience where she hears the voice of Rochester calling her. The next morning she decides to go back to Thornville and find out where, what has happened to Rochester. When she goes back to Rochester's, to find Rochester, she realizes that Thornville never, no longer exists. Why? Because it has been burned down by a lunatic. The villagers tell that uh, Bartha Mason had jumped into the fire and died. So Bartha Mason is happily rid of. Now there is not, no problem between Jane and Rochester to get married. Jane looks for Rochester. She has to travel to a place called Fern Dean. Now this is the fifth geographical location and the last phase of her life. Ferns are very gentle, uh, you know, vegetation. So it's soft, it's gentle. Her, her reward phase has come in her life. And she travels to Ferndean to find Rochester. She finds that the fire has blinded the man. And this time, Jane is very eager to accept Rochester's proposal for marriage if Rochester will propose. Rochester has also lost use of one arm in the fire because it was a big fire and he tried to save his wife, uh, first wife. Now you will find that Jane believes now she is equal of Rochester. Earlier, Rochester was her employer. He had everything. He had money. He had a family. Okay. He had wealth. He had power. He, he was her employer. And Jane was at a lower position. Jane possibly did not like that situation in life. Now the table seem to have turned. She has money because she's inherited. She has family. She has found the three rivers with whom she gets along very well. Plus, now being able-bodied, she will be able to look after a handicapped person like Rochester. So she feels that she's in a superior situation. And once she realizes that she has a superiority over Rochester, she has no problems about accepting him as a husband. The story ends very differently. Another couple of years down the line, Rochester regains his eyesight when the, the first child is born to them and everything ends happily. But these are the very simple narrative from beginning to end, going through five geographical locations for Jane. But a lot of feminist interpretations can be done in it. Have any questions for me? Any of you? Okay, yes. Now, if Jane is uh, such a self-respecting person, then why does she return to the gate shed uh, to meet Mrs. Uh, Reid, uh, despite Mrs. Reid having been uh, uh, cruel to her in the past? It's about a very conventional character. And if Jane does not go back to meet her dying relative, then Jane would be actually having a shade in her character which is very grey. 
I, I personally feel that uh, Charlotte Bronte did not want Jane to have so much of grey, already making her such a passionate, outspoken person. She is very outspoken, she speaks her mind out. Plus, there is something called um, a stage in life she has reached, which is rather a happier phase. Because if you see, she comes back from the visit and she, immediately after that, Rochester is proposing. So, I think happiness makes her a more secured person. Now, she is no longer insecure and having found the security in Rochester's attention to her, I will not call it love as yet, um, love for her or attention for her, that she is ready to confront her past. So, it is, it is from security. She, she knows now she can disregard any, uh, anything that has been done to her, any cruel things that has been done to her. What I feel about this novel is this. This novel is not, not just about feminism, but it's a text of disability studies. Because there's an instant where Broth Mason gets imprisoned yeah. by her husband. Yes. So, what do you... That is really a very, very interesting uh, topic and uh, you will find that a lot has been written. Now, if you open the internet and the sites, connected sites, you will find a lot of discussion has happened on this aspect. Uh, just as Red Room is a prison for Jane, Bartha Mason's imprisonment and the attic represents subjugation of women to male dominance. Bartha Mason's character is such that she's a beautiful, wealthy woman. Rochester had heard that she was promiscuous in her life. So, all that was deviant behavior for the woman in that particular society. A woman was expected to behave in a certain manner and Bartha Mason was not behaving in that manner. So, she was wayward, she was mad and a mad person is never given a place in the society. So, she is shoved into another place, she is not going to be accepted, she is a disturbance of the family life. Rochester cannot have a life with her because she is a deviant behavior. So, this, but it is a very, very long discussion and uh, it requires a lot of studying also. I do not think this answer actually satisfies you, but more can be done. Now, I am going to ask you all a question. Okay, you tell me, uh, have you read a story called Wuthering Heights? Yes. Can, do you know the name of the author? Emily Bronte. Very nice. Emily Bronte and Charlotte Bronte were sisters. I mm -hmm. hope you know that. Now, Wuthering Heights and uh, Jane Ayad, both supposed to be passionate novels. Yeah, Uthering Height is an elimination passion. Jane Ayad, I find, is more, is more conventional novel. Yes, the, it's a much higher Nine level of passion in Withering Heights. Nine Only novel. artistic control keeps it under control. Very good yes. answer. Jane Ayad has a very simple plot. It is a natural progression from young Jane's life as it is of a poor orphan girl and it matures phase of Jane's life where she meets her love of life, marries and settles down to happy domesticity. Now this novel many critics have divided into five parts calling it a novel in five acts. They have said that as Jane moved geographically from one part of the story to another part, a new phase in her life begins. So, her first phase of life, which is a life of self-denial, happens in Gateshead with her cousins and her aunt, Mrs. Reed. She goes through enormous hardship, emotional as well as physical, while she lives with them. When she moves to the next phase of her life in located Lowood school, her life is scarcely any better. She is once again made to go through difficult phase, subjected to humiliation, subjected to insults simply because of her status in life as an orphan who is dependent on the state charity to give her an education. This phase of life in low wood improves uh, definitely, but bef before this improvement actually happens, she has to go through uh, a lot more of experience. Since, for example, she also experiences death of her best friend, Helen, who dies of consumption. In the next phase of her life, 
She works as a governess. She hopes that the life in Thornfield, the third phase of her life, is going to be slightly more improved, a little better, liberating her as a woman, as a teacher. But it is really not that easy here either. We come across Blanche Ingram. She is a woman of a much superior rank, an aristocrat herself. And this lady is ready to insult Jane, just as uh, her aunt had insulted her when she was young, calling her a dependent, calling her someone who's a burden to the society. When Rochester proposes uh, marriage to Jane, Jane feels that she has overcome these difficult stages only to be corrected by realization that Rochester was going to commit a biogamy if she actually married him. In this phase, she runs away and she finds refuge with her cousins, uh, the rivers, without knowing that she, uh, they are actually her cousins and she has found a home finally. This part of her life is definitely more pleasurable phase of her life. Almost as if good that she has begun in her life are being returned to her. St. John Rivers finds in Jane a dependable companion, proposes to her. But Jane is horrified by the fact that she would enter loveless marriage. And the climax of the story comes when she discovers having supernatural calling that uh, Bartha Mason is no longer alive. There is no other obstacle to her getting married to um, Rochester. So there is a plot which finds its denouncement in the final marriage. Rochester also, because of his promiscuous days in the earlier life, needs to go through a kind of a purgation. Now this purgation happens when he loses his eyesight, his hand, uh, he is incapacitated by the fire. This is his purgation and through this purgation he has moved to be with Jane, Jane at, at a level where they can actually lead a life together. Now we are going to discuss the style, the tone of this novel Jane Eyre. Now the most important thing about Jane Eyre is it's a very emotional, it's a very passionate, it's a very charged novel. It's very feverish in the way the words come tumbling out of the heroine's expression. Now the protagonist is a passionate person. She is given to extreme swing of emotions and all the sentences that she speaks are full of adjectives, full of images. I will read to you one, uh, for example, let's look when she gets angry with her cousin, what does she say? She says, wicked and cruel boy, I said, you are like a murderer, you are like a slave driver, you are like a Roman emperor. So she gets so angry and this is, this is the syntax and style that she follows throughout the story. And, and she cleverly intermingles it with descriptive passages, narrative passages. But never is there any oversimplification of idea happening. All her ideas are interconnected. One thing leading to the other. There is a link. And, and that plot progression which is absolutely flat and very simple is bound with her unique style. She overwhelms her readers because some readers are not used to this kind of uh, emotional outpouring. Uh, and, and many readers who are used to a more restrained language of say Jane Austen find uh, Charlotte Bronte extremely complex to understand. But Charlotte Bronte is presenting a passionate character. Jane Eyre is an extremely emotional person. We cannot imagine Jane Eyre in any other language. If she had spoken in more elegant terms, in more elegant language, she would not be Jane Eyre herself. It would be someone else. And she has intense anger. She has terrible uh, mood swings. She has immense sadness and she has, when her anger hits her, she is ready to be absolutely headstrong and about expressing her emotions. She refuses to be a martyr. She does not like Helen Burns because Helen Burns is accepting. For Jane, it is very important that she sees some kind of injustice she must protest against it. She cannot stay cool. She cannot be elegant and she cannot always uh, 
conform to the social norms that have been cut out for him. And uh, as far as the genre of this novel is concerned, we can say that it's a romance because she meets Rochester, Rochester and she together they build a future. So th to that extent, it's a novel of romance. The fact that it is also can be called a supernatural kind of a gothic novel because uh, we have many moments in that, at least three examples, very clear examples. One in the red room experience where she sees the ghost of her uncle. She imagines she sees the ghost of her uncle. Second time when she is in Lowood, uh, having served two years as a teacher, she hears an inner voice asking her to put in an advertisement in the newspaper and insertion to get a job outside Lowood. The third time at the end she hears a voice which almost links her like a kindred spirit to Rochester. She feels that Rochester is calling out to her and she knows at that point in time for definite that she cannot stay on a, with the rivers and she must make this journey back to her past and try to reconnect with Rochester. So these are uh, some of the ways in which the critics have down the years uh, assessed, analyzed this novel and uh, the fantasy element of Bronte, the supernatural element of Bron Bronte and, and also the romantic element in this novel have always been deeply appreciated by all readers down the ages.